If you hold your Bibles up, let's pray. Father, we come holding your word high and exalting it. We pray today, Lord, that you would help us to understand clearly what your word says. That you would teach us how to love as you have loved us. Instruct us, teach us, and help us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, your, your bulletin is wrong. We're going to be in John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We've been going through this uh, mini topical series on the love of Christ. And we have seen that Christ's love for his people, the church, is an unstoppable love. That nothing can come between Christ and his people. That he loves us and he leads us to victory over sin, over the flesh, over the world, over the devil. We're reminded that Christ's love for us brought him to the cross to die for us. And that he rose and he ascended as our representative, promising us eternal life. And because he loves us, he's going to bring us to where he is. We saw that his love is the ultimate motivator for living the Christian life. That we should live in light of his love. That it compels us. And we even talked about how our cold hearts can be warmed by the blazing fire of Christ's love. We saw that his love is stronger than death. It's a sacrificial love. It's an ancient love that he loved us before we were even born. It's a prevailing love that he conquers our hearts with. A sustaining love, a faithful love, a free love that he gives when we don't deserve it. It's an everlasting love that will have no end. And we concluded last week that it was an amazing love. This morning, I want us to see that the love of Christ is also a love worth imitating. In fact, it's a command for us to imitate the love of Christ. And that seems like an impossible task, and I guess it really is. But it is a command nonetheless. And we're going to look at Christ's love from the angle this morning of imitating it. Living in His love, being filled with His love, and then pouring that love out on one another. And so we're going to read um, John chapter 13, verses 31 to 38. And our focus is going to be verses 34 and 35. If you're able, stand as we read God's Word. Starting in verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, that is Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. You can be seated. So I want us to focus in on this passage, specifically verses 34 and 35, where Jesus gives a new commandment that we are to love one another as he has loved us. And Jesus gives this command a title, new. It's a new commandment. In some ways, some people say it's the 11th commandment. Christ here tells his disciples that he is giving them this new command. But if we know our Old Testament, we will know that there is a commandment in the Old Testament to love our neighbor as ourself. And some people think that that's what Jesus is telling his disciples here. But it's really not. The Old Testament tells us to love our neighbor as ourself. And as we've seen a few months back, the last six commandments of the Ten Commandments kind of flesh that out for us. So why is Jesus saying this is a new commandment? Because Christ is giving us an old commandment with a greater depth to it. He's making this commandment fresh. The Apostle John, we just read it in 1 John chapter 2, makes this same point. He says it's an old commandment, but yet it's a new commandment. John goes on to tell us to love one another in 1 John 2. But he says that it's new because it's in Christ. So this old commandment is new because it's given in a fresh way with added depth. Let me give you a couple ways that this commandment is new so you understand what I'm saying. First of all, it's new in who it's towards. It's new in its extent. This new commandment is not that we are to love every person. We are to love every person. But the new commandment is that 
We are to love a very specific group of people with a deeper love. Jesus says, love one another to his disciples, specifically to love the church, fellow Christians. If you remember, I told you when we started the series, and just about every week we've been going through it, looking at the love of Christ, I reminded you that Jesus loves everyone, but he loves his people with a special, deeper, affectionate love. Just like you have your friends, but you don't love your friends to the same depth that you love your spouse. It's different. So Christ has a depth of love and a special love for his people. And here in this command, he is telling us to love Christians the same way. We love the world, but we love Christians with a special extra depth of love. So it's new because it's a deeper love. It's a higher call to love, to love God's people. And this might sound kind of contrary to what's popular in Christianity today, but, but we, are to, we are to have a greater love, more depth for those who are believers. This command is new because it's got a different reason behind it. The old command to love our neighbor as ourself was anchored in God bringing Israel out of Egypt. And he says, because I've brought you out of Egypt, therefore you are to love your neighbor. But this new command is given in light of the cross. That we are to love one another as Christ has loved us who died for us and gave his life for us and redeemed us. It's new because it comes from a new source. We are to love other people because we are like them. We are to love everyone because we're, we have a common thing. We're all people. And so we love people. But we're to love believers more because we are of the same kingdom. We are fellow partakers of Christ and of the divine nature. And so we are bound to duty to love one another as Christ has loved us. We are fellow servants of the same king. And so we are to love one another with a special depth to that love. It's new because there's a new loveliness in other believers. We love people in the world because there might be something lovely in them. But we love other believers because we know there's something lovely in them. Christ. They have the blood of Christ applied to their life. The spirit of love indwells them, and so we are to love them with a stronger, deeper love. It's new because we have a new hope. We must love each other with a greater, stronger love because we will spend eternity with each other. There will be no hate in heaven. There will be no unforgiveness or bitterness in heaven. There should not be, that should not even be named among Christians because it won't be in heaven. The church should be a small slice of heaven on earth, and the love that we have in heaven for one another should be practiced on earth. This command is new because it takes the old commandment further. And it is new because we have the great demonstration of it in Christ. And this is really the main point that Christ is making in this passage. This commandment is new because it's been demonstrated by Him. And so number one in your notes is this. The commandment is new because Jesus has come and given us the perfect example of love. Jesus has come and given us the perfect example of love. As he says, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We are to love as Christ loved. We are to follow his example. Again, this is not required of us to love all men with this love. We are to love all men as we love ourselves. But we are to love the brethren as Christ loves them. And that's a totally different thing. How did Christ love us? To death. To death. We should give our lives for believers. There's more intimacy and more affection. We are to love one another, not just our fellow human beings, but brothers and sisters in Christ, to practice a family love. You think about your own family. You love those in your own family even though they annoy you, even though you don't always agree with each other. Even when they're mean and hateful towards you, you still care for them. Why? Because they're family. It's a deeper love that you have for them than you do just the stranger on the street. There's a different kind of love. It's not that you don't love the stranger. It's that you have a deeper, stronger love for your family, even when they annoy you, that you would still sacrifice everything to help them. That's the love that we're called to have for the church, for other believers. So how does that look? Well, we know the, th we know the things we have been talking about the past several weeks about the love of Christ and what that looks like and how Christ has loved us. But I want to give you some specific examples from this passage that we see and so number two, I have multiple little subpoints under there. So letter A is this. We are to love one another unselfishly. Unselfishly. 
Christ loved his disciples unselfishly. What did Christ gain by choosing his disciples? What did he gain by putting up with their nonsense and their sin and their betrayal? He loved them even when he was the one giving and receiving nothing. He didn't selfishly demand that he gain. Now someone might argue and say, well, well Christ, was, Christ was worshipped by them. He gained worship. Really? You, you think that little band of fishermen can worship Christ in the way that the angels worshipped him in heaven? Sure, he gained obedience from them. But do you think that that little band of fishermen, that they could bring obedience to Christ like the angels can? Yet Christ left heaven and those angels to come and redeem those fishermen. He gained nothing. He was unselfish in dying for them. And this is true of how he loves you and me. He loves us, though he reaps no benefit. He could much sooner preach the gospel to the world and bring glory to his name without us. Yet he chooses to use us and to put up with us. Yet he unselfishly loves us and even chooses to use us for that purpose so that we can experience his goodness and his love and have purpose. This is not to mention his unselfish sacrifice where he died on the cross to redeem us. To truly love is not to wait to be served by the person, but to meet them in their need and help them. To serve them. And that's what Christ has done for us. It is his unselfish love for us that makes us his and sent him to the cross to die for those he loves. And Christ says that we are to love one another, other Christians, with that same love. That we are to love other believers with an unselfish love, with a self-denying love. To love the church in such a way that we give up our benefits for the sake of others. That we are to love one another, not for what we get from it, but so that we can love them and point them to Christ. That we can demonstrate Christ. We do it for what we can do for one another. To love. I've heard asked, not by anybody here, mind you, but I've heard this asked. What benefit do I have in becoming a member of a church? I mean, what does it matter if I'm a church member? I mean, I'm a member at Sam's Club, and I get all these discounts and benefits. Sadly, this is how people think of the church. Why should I become a member of your church? What benefit is there to me? Well, you get to love others as Christ loves you. That's the benefit. If you come to church only to gain something for yourself, you're not following Christ. If you're only looking out for what you can get from the church or what the church can do for your kids, you are not following Christ. If you look for a church that has all the things you like and all the things that you want, you're not following Christ. Would it not be more Christ-like to find a church that needs you to serve than to find a church that has everything to serve you? You join the church not to be served, but to serve. To give your life away as our Lord did in service to others, namely to other believers. We have to get away from a, this consumeristic idea of church. That the church exists to, to offer us some sort of benefit. We are the body of Christ and we exist to serve Selfishness is a fruit of pride, and we're to love with humility. Counting others is more important than ourselves. If we are to love like Christ, we must make others our concern. Not just getting credit for ourselves, but promoting others. We must concern ourselves with the well-being of others, with their spiritual health, their safety, their benefits. Man, who are you and who am I to demand that we should have things our way? Who are you to demand to be more important? To be treated as special? Who are you to demand that you go to church with all sorts of perks for you? Who are you to demand that others treat you with respect and honor? Who are you to demand to be served? Who are you to demand such things? Are you greater than Jesus? Of course not. And yet Christ said he came to serve and not be served. He came to give his life away for those whom he loved. And if Christ is greater than us, and that's the example he's given us, then how should we live? If we are to love unselfishly, then we are to make others the priority, willing to give up our time, our resources, our health for their benefit. To love like Jesus means we are laying down our lives for each other. You know, it's almost easy to say, I would die for you. It's almost easy to say that to someone because you know that the chances of that actually happening are very unlikely. 
A better question to ask you is, is are you dying for people now? Are you willing to die for yourself in service to others? Because that's what we're called to do. To die daily to self. To die to our desires and our goals. To not hold bitterness or hold up our demands or our rights. But to die to ourself and to love others. And to put self behind them. Let her be. We are to love one another compassionately. We are to love one another compassionately. Christ loved us compassionately. He understood our weaknesses. He met us where we were. We see this even in the passage in verse 33. The disciples are, they're, they're, Jesus is comforting them. He knows he's about to go and die. And yet he is being compassionate towards them because he knows what they're about to experience. In fact, if you keep reading and you get to John 14, you see that Jesus is really comforting them, that he's going away, but I'm going to come and get you and bring you to where I am. He's, he's comforting them. He's showing them compassion. He's bearing with them in their fear and their weakness and their sadness. He's helping to bear their burden while at the same time, the burden of everyone's sin is being laid on him. Christ is compassionate towards us also, forgiving us and strengthening us and caring for us in our weakness. He shows compassion which is recognizing what a person is, where they're at, and what they need, and then helping them. Christ shows pity to us in our weakness. He seeks to bear our burden. And he tells us that we are to love one another with the same love, with compassionate love, understanding that we're all sinners and that we're weak, that we all fail and we make mistakes, that we have struggles and challenges, that we need help and support. Paul even says in Romans 12, 15, that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. He says in Galatians 6.2 that we are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know what the law of Christ is? Love. Love moves us to get down into the slime with each other. It was Christ's compassionate love in which he took on human flesh and came to where we are and met us in our need and saved us. So we not have compassion towards one another? To pray for one another, to help one another in love. Maybe you say, but I don't have any way to help such and such a brother out. I'm not physically able or I'm not financially able to help them. But you can pray. Compassion is showing pity on them in their struggle and suffering and to do what you can for them. And prayer is first and greatest thing you can do for anyone anyway. And then after that, if possible, put feet to your prayers. But don't think because your health is not good or because you're poor that you are unable to have compassion. You can always pray and you should always pray for one another. Which leads us to letter C. We are to love one another practically. Practically. We are to put it into practice. It's not just something we talk about. Christ loved in practice, in deed and in truth. The love of Christ that he showed us was not mere words. He demonstrated his love by going all the way to the cross and dying. His love was not just comforting words, but it was action. And our love for one another should be expressed in how we treat one another, and how we talk to one another, and how we help one another. And in a moment, we'll see that it's that love that actually demonstrates who we follow. It points to Christ. Love in the Bible is a verb. It's something that we do. And so we should be loving one another as Christ has loved us in practice. The Apostle John said it this way in 1 John 3, in verse 16, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. John says, we know the love of God because Christ died for us. And if we know the love of God and we see our brother in need, and we turn away like he doesn't need help and we're able to help him, how does the love of God dwell in us? The point is, is that we're to love them by helping them, by doing what they need, meeting their need, by loving in deed and in truth. And so let us love each other that way, not in word only, but in how we treat each other, to help one another, how we talk about one another when the other person isn't around. Let us love one another enough that it moves us to the action of prayer, constantly praying for one another. You search the Bible, and you will rarely find a prayer for a lost person. Most of the prayers in the Bible are for other believers. Because we're to pray for each other. We should have a love that we practice, not just a theory we talk about, so that the world can see the love of Christ among us. 
Letter D, we are to love one another mercifully. Christ loved his disciples with mercy. We see this in verses 36 and 38, it's alluded to. We know that Jesus here is talking about Peter betraying him. And yet, after Jesus tells Peter, he's going to betray me, you're going to betray me, what does he go on and do in chapter 14? He comforts him. He gives him comforting words. He shows Peter mercy. And then even after Jesus rises from the dead, he goes back to Peter and restores him. There's nothing we can do to push away the the love of Christ from us. We've seen this in previous weeks. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. No matter how many times we sin against Him, no matter how many times we wrong Him and take advantage of His grace and misuse His mercy, Christ forgives and shows compassion to us. Every time we come back to Him and confess our wrongdoing, Christ is quick to wash us clean. I've given Christ a million reasons to not love me. And not one of them has convinced Him. And we should rejoice in that. And if we are to love one another as Christ has loved us, then we should love one another with mercy. Even when others wrong us, we're to forgive. Even when others in the church hurt us, they treat us wrongly, they forget us, they leave us out, we're to show mercy and forgiveness and love them as Christ has loved us. Not even that, but even if they sin against us, with the same sin, over and over, in the same day, we're to forgive. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you with the same sin in the same day, up to 70 times 7, you're to forgive him. We are to forgive one another, no excuses. We are not to hold grudges towards one another, but to be compassionate. We are even to love one another, even if we are being taken advantage of. And we are to forgive our brother who is taking advantage of us. And we are to continue loving them. Now, this doesn't mean that we ignore wrong. Because love also means that you want someone, you want the best for someone. And Christ, in His love, disciplines us. And there are times for hard love where we must, in order to get the attention of our brother, call out their sin. And an unrepentant brother must be disciplined with the goal of winning him back. In fact, if you read Matthew 18, where Jesus gives us the instruction for church discipline, the goal of that is to restore your brother. That's the whole point. It's not to hurt him. It's not to embarrass him. It's to restore him. To restore his faith. And so we go to our brother and we tell him his fault. And if he hears us, we've won our brother. It's mercy. But we're to do it in a loving way. We are to show mercy and compassion, forgiving, not hating him, but loving him enough to do the hard thing. And the moment he repents, we welcome him with open arms and open hearts because we love mercifully as Christ has loved us. In fact, if a Christian sins against you, you should pray to the Lord for them to be restored and to repent. You should pray for God to forgive them for what they've done to you. Is that not the example we see in Christ? On the cross, being crucified by those men, what did Christ pray? Father, forgive them. He prayed for those who were injuring him and causing him to suffer. So if we have a Christian brother who is causing us to suffer, they're causing pain in our life, we should pray to God to forgive them. Because that's the love of Christ. That's the mercy of love. Letter E. We are to love one another patiently. I know that's everyone's favorite word. Patience. Christ is patient towards his disciples. We see Peter's questioning. We see the disciples' ignorance. We see that their constant unbelief. And yet Christ is patient with them. And he's patient with us. Christ shows us patience a thousand times a day. How often are we foolish and ignorant? How often do we run off into things that we know we shouldn't do? How often is our hearts wavered from him and attracted to the very things we know will destroy us? And yet Christ is the good shepherd. He comes And he gathers us to himself and he brings us back to the fold. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't get flustered. He doesn't get angry at us. He's patient and he's gentle and he's kind. And we are told to love one another as Christ has loved us. How then should we treat one another in our faults? How should we respond to a believer whose personality is different than ours and maybe even annoys us a little bit? How should we treat that believer who seems to stumble and struggle with the same thing over and over and over? How should we react to that mother who brings her child into church and he's crying and distracting everyone? With patient love. Showing care and compassion. Listening to our brothers. Bearing their burdens. Giving them our ear and our prayers. 
not running off and gossiping about it, but loving them and praying for them. We are to love one another with patience. We endure with one another, even when the other person is making our life hard. I've been around other pastors who complain about certain people in their church, who make life difficult for them and for their ministry of their church. And you know what I've come to realize? That when that happens, that's actually a gift from God. Difficult people are a gift from God because it gives us a chance to demonstrate the love of Christ. You see, the test of your love isn't how you love the easy people. The test of your love is how you love the unlovely and how you love the people who cause your life difficulty. That's the test of love. Those who in your flesh you want to love least is the one that you should love the most, that you should show the most compassion towards. In fact, patience, patience is the very first characteristic of love mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. And so we should pray that the Lord makes us patient towards one another in order that we can love as Christ has loved us. Jesus, like the good teacher he is, gives us in this passage the reason that we should love this way. Why should we love one another as Christ has loved us? Why should we do this difficult thing? Verse 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. By this they will know that you follow me. When we love the church like Christ, we demonstrate that we follow him. Our love for God's people is the proof that we love Christ and that we follow after him. And so number three is this. Our love for one another is the evidence that we follow Jesus. Our love for one another is the evidence that we follow Jesus. Which makes perfect sense if you really think about it. If I'm a disciple of Christ, then I'm going to begin to do things the way he does. I'm going to begin to think the way he does. I'm going to begin to act and respond to circumstances and situations the way he does. He's my teacher. He's instructing me on how to live. And so as I follow Jesus, I'm being made more into his likeness. And the more into his likeness I'm made, the more loving I will be. And we will express and practice that love unselfishly with mercy, compassion, and patience. And this is John's argument in that famous verse in 1 John chapter 4. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It's the same argument. Why do we love one another and not hate? Because we serve God and God is love. Because we know God and God is love. Why do we love one another with this deeper, affectionate love that we would even be willing to give up our lives for one another? Why? Because Christ has loved us. Love is the ultimate test of discipleship. Those who follow Christ must love. We must love one another because it flows from a heart that is filled with his love. And Jesus says that all men will know who we follow by this love. The lost world will know that we follow Jesus. It's a testimony to the world that we follow Christ when we love. How we treat one another as Christians actually teaches the world about the one we follow. What a grand idea for outreach. That if we want to reach the loss, we must start by loving each other here. Far too often in our modern world, in the church, we put the emphasis on getting lost people to church and make the emphasis on loving the lost and we should love the lost, don't mishear me. But there is a deeper love that we should have for the brethren. And I'm arguing that we should actually love one another first. That, that to learn to love each other with this deeper love actually helps us to reach the lost. For example, if I had $100 that I could give that was extra in my budget, and there's a believer and an unbeliever both in need of $100 to pay their bills, who should I give the hundred dollars to? Modern convention says give it to the unbeliever because then you have an opportunity to share the gospel. The New Testament teaches I give that money to the believer, to my brother. Because I love the unbeliever as I love myself, but I am to love the believer as Christ has loved me. Which love is greater? In fact, the Apostle Paul illustrates this in 1 Corinthians and I'm going to paraphrase this. Basically, 
Paul says, if you and a new believer are going to have dinner at an unbeliever's house, and that unbeliever serves meat, and the new believer says, where did, where did this meat come from? And he says, oh, it came from the pagan temple market. And that new believer says, oh, I can't eat that. That was sacrificed to idols. Well, the question that Paul poses to us is, what should you do? Should you eat the meat so you don't offend the unbeliever? Or should you not eat the meat so you don't offend your new brother? What should you do? Paul says, you don't eat the meat because you don't want to offend your brother. You don't want to cause him to stumble. And later on down the road, when he learns that it's okay to eat that meat, it's not actually bad, then he, he'll be all right. But if you teach him now to violate his conscience, you're going to give him a bad habit. So you need to teach him now to listen to his conscience. If his conscience says it's wrong, then you go with him in that. That's what Paul says. Paul says you don't eat the meat and you offend the unbeliever because you don't want to teach your new brother to violate his conscience. And Paul says that it is through that act of not offending your brother that you actually can win the lost man because he sees the love of Christ that you have for your brother. It's a completely different worldview than many churches have. We should inconvenience ourselves for the sake of not offending our brother over things that are unimportant to us but are important to him, giving priority to our brother. We should exercise love for one another and demonstrate that we follow Christ by loving each other in this way. So, application on this. How do we love as Jesus loved us? How do we actually do this? Well, in a sense, it's really impossible. We don't really have the capacity for his love. We, because we follow Christ, though. We represent him. And we want to bring him glory. We are to strive to love with his love. And there is a way to help us grow in this kind of love for one another. And this is number four in your notes. We learn to love as Jesus loved by being near him and obeying his word. By following Christ. Like I said a minute ago, if we are following Jesus, we are being transformed into his likeness. And the more like him we become, the more loving we become. So we must spend time with the Lord. We must go to him in prayer, draw near to him. We must constantly go to his word for guidance and help and to hear what he has to say to us. We must be in the prayer closet for strength. We must pray for the Spirit to shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. You know, your heart is like a storehouse. It's like a warehouse. And we can only take out what we put in. And if we want to love one another as Christ loves us, then we should fill our hearts with Christ. We should fill our minds and thoughts with Christ. We must be overtaken by the love of Christ. He must be our passion. He must be our life. We must seek Christ in everything and rely constantly on Him for the strength to live. We must rest in Christ. We must seek Christ. We must love Christ. We must know Christ. And when we have made Christ our all in all, then we will begin to learn what it means to love others as he has loved us. Let that be our goal. And let me urge you this morning, if some of this sounds foreign to you, if you have no love for the people of God, if you don't know Christ, then let me tell you that you are a great sinner. And because of your sin, you are justly condemned under the wrath of God. But God, in His great mercy, has sent His Son to die on the cross for your sin. And the Bible says that if you would trust in Him and believe that He would redeem you, He would save you, He would forgive your sin and give you eternal life. That there is an invitation to come to Christ and to know Him and to know His love and to be transformed by Him. And so let us, as the people of God, learn to love one another as Christ has loved us and given His life for us. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you for your love that you have for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love that you have shown to us. And we pray that as disciples of yours, that you would help us to be transformed more and more into your likeness. That we might love one another as you have loved us. Help us. Help us to be merciful in our love. Help us to be compassionate, unselfish. Help us to, to be willing to deny ourselves to promote others, to, to seek the best for one another. And Lord, we pray that you would use that to demonstrate to this lost world your love for us. That they would see that and that they would want to be a part of your church. That they would want to know you. 
Father, we pray that you would help us with this, that you would change us and transform us. In Jesus' name, amen.